The Harvard sociologist Professor Nicholas Christakis was once known by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He's giving a talk at Cass Business School, his specialist subject, behaviour and human relationships, key things for the world of business. He's with me now. Professor Christakis, these are quite fuzzy concepts. How does the world of business measure them? So most uh, companies, when they think about their workers, think about the human capital of their workers. And this has become a rather conventional way of thinking about the talents, abilities, interests, and even desires of their workers. But what we're interested in is not so much the intrinsic ability of the workers themselves, but rather how arranging the workers in different ways, either deliberately or accidentally, workers come together to form groups socially or practically or, or deliberately in the firm how those arrangements affect the productivity, health, cooperation, and innovativeness of the workers. And what we've shown using a variety of mathematical tools, statistical tools, and different sorts of experiments is that it's possible to arrange human beings or to find different sorts of arrangements which occur naturally in human beings. And it's those arrangements, those social network structures, and here I mean face-to-face -face networks, not online networks, that give the group important properties. The, it's the difference between human capital and social capital, and, and that's the thing that we're studying. How, where does social capital come from, how to cultivate it, how to make it? Yes, when we were speaking earlier, you gave uh, quite a nice mental picture example of how this can work involving the um, atoms of carbon representing human, human connections. So yeah, that's right. So one of the analogies that I like to use to cultivate intuitions about this is to ask people to remember what they learned about uh, uh, carbon atoms, often in high school. So carbon atoms, um, carbon can appear in a number of forms on our planet. Two of the forms are very well known, graphite, which is soft and dark and in pencil leads, and diamond, which is hard and clear. And if you think about that, there are two key ideas there. First, this softness and darkness and hardness and clearness are not properties of the carbon atoms. They are properties of the collection of carbon atoms. Second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Connect them another way, you get a completely different set of properties. And it's the same with human groups. You can take a group of people with a fixed amount of human capital, a certain set of traits and abilities, and you connect them one way and you make them uncreative and mean to each other and unhealthy. Or you connect them another way and you make them innovative and kind to each other and healthy. And it's not the people themselves so much that matters, it's the pattern of ties between them that's crucial. So if you're a business owner or a manager, how do you go about, what's the first thing you should do to try and improve the human connections in your business? So the problem is that it's very difficult to give a summary piece of advice. The easiest or most abstract piece of advice I would give is that connections matter. And in fact, in some ways, connections can be more important than the people themselves. That part's easy to communicate, and many people would have an intuitive grasp of that. But the problem is, is that there's no one network that's optimized for any function. So for example, I would organize people one way if I wanted to maximize the flow of information within that group of people. And people may have an intuition about how you, people should have the intuition at least that there is a, a way you can imagine that you could organize people so information would flow optimally. But that same organization of people would be terrible if a pathogen like Ebola was spreading through the network. Now you would want a completely different organization. Hence the organization of human beings into networks, there is no one optimal organization. It depends on what you wish to achieve. So for example, if you're trying to achieve rapid flow of information, you would organize the network differently than if you were trying to achieve uh, minimal flow of germs. And so the point is, is that there's not a simple set of rules that you can implement everywhere that always works. It's kind of like asking, what's the best car? Well, if you want to drive fast on an autobahn, uh, maybe a particular car is better. If you want to plow a farm, a different kind of car. If you want to go off-road, yet another kind of car. So the answer is a very unsatisfying, it depends. But there is an increasing knowledge and wisdom that can guide our understanding and our application of these ideas. So even though it depends, there are answers to specific questions. So can you give us a first step? Is understanding the ties between their workers, understanding how people are connected to each other, understanding the informal social organization of the group, not just the formal organization of the group, but understanding it in a way that deploys uh, scientific advances in network science, in the deep mathematical, psychological, 
biological and sociological understanding of human social interactions. Professor Christakis, thank you very much. Thank you very much.